Hi, I'm here with Ian Crawford, designer for Icarus Interstellar. All right, you've been writing about interstellar space travel for a number of years. Um, how do you think that Icarus is making a positive contribution to this? I think Icarus is making a very important contribution. Mm -hmm. um, one of the pioneering uh, studies for interstellar starship design was the Daedalus project, now over 30 years ago. And the Icarus project is, is, is trying to, to update that earlier work in the light of all the technical developments that have happened over the last 30 years. And so I think this is a tremendously important thing um, because so much, so much has changed technically uh, over the last 30 years. Our knowledge in so many relevant fields has increased um, that now is a very uh, opportune time to take that earlier work and update it. I think that's the way to view it, to update the, the earlier Daedalus study to see whether it still holds water uh, and whether it might be even easier to build a starship than was envisaged 30 years ago. Do you think that uh, Daedalus was a little soon? You know, like, a little t like before its time? I think Daedalus project, it was before its time in the sense that it was a, a late 1970s concept. Uh -huh. And it was clear that in the late 1970s, technically, it would have been impossible to build a vehicle like Daedalus. But nevertheless, it was pioneering because it did set the scene. It identified those technologies that would have to be developed before it was possible to build a starship, really. So I, I don't think it was ahead of its time. I, I, I think it was, it was at the right time because it set people thinking about yeah. these issues at just the right time. Time. Um, and what's happened now, of course, has been 30 years of progress in mm -hmm. science and technology, uh, which we can now build, take that earlier study and update it and build upon it. Yeah, you know, going along with that, do you think that interstellar space travel is a very feasible thing to do now, or do you think it's still too much before its time? Well, I think it's a very good question that I think interstellar space travel is certainly physically possible so we yes. know it's possible to travel to the, to the stars even quite quickly a Daedalus showed that Icarus will confirm that um, unfortunately that doesn't mean we're ready to do it right now I think everything we've learned with the Daedalus and Icarus studies is it is still technically very challenging um. but more than that <laughs> it'll be economically and politically very challenging I mean in, in a sense you know we've had the technology to go to Mars for the last 20 years maybe but <laughs> that's true but, but, but we're not on mars and the reasons for that are less to do with the technicalities as to do with the economics and the politics of it so i'm afraid i don't think we're despite the icarus study mm -hmm. we're in a position to build a starship you know within the next few years or anything like yeah. that but I, but despite that i think these studies are important because they're gradually building a um a road map yeah. uh, of, of, of identifying those technical issues that we'd have to solve so that when we're ready and when we can afford it, uh, we can actually do it. You know, that's funny. A lot of people have actually mentioned that, that they thought that politically and economically, those were the things holding us back. What are the steps you think it would take politically and economically to really push that to the next level? I think it would... I think the, disco the, dis the discovery, I mean, one of the new things that's happened in uh -huh. recent years is a discovery of planets around nearby stars. When the Daedalus study was done, n uh, we expected planets to exist around stars, but none had been discovered because the first one was discovered in 1995. Exactly. And, and now, now there's, well, and now there's about almost two, if you include the Kepler results, almost 2,000 known planets around. So we now know, we now know there's a target potentially targets planets which might be around other stars potentially within range so i think what would really change things is if we discovered that one of these planets rel around a relatively nearby star were inhabited i think that would certainly provide, really set things apart it would, it would certainly provide a scientific driver that's currently lacking now whether that would be enough to motivate uh the politics and the economics of it I don't know, but I do think it would be very helpful. Certainly finding a, 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 an inhabited planet nearby would be a tremendous, Im, tremendous impetus to the... the, to the, the, to the political and economical yes, things. I, I think that's the way to view it, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, all right, so do you think it matters whether the probe is a flyby mission or do you think it actually needs to orbit around something? Yes, I think it matters a great deal. I think it, to, to, be, to make scientific sense, I think the probe has to decelerate and stop at the other end or enter into orbit about the star it's, or planets that it's, that it's going to visit. Um, the Daedalus study was a flyby study yes. and in the late 1970s that made a lot of sense um, because the astronomical observations of nearby stars in the, in the 1970s were still quite limited 
and it was clear that even a flyby mission that lasted only a few hours, it would tell you much more about this target star and its planets than you could get using telescopes from the, from the Earth. But I think that is no longer true. If you look at the development of astronomical technology over the last 30 years, and the very large telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, the next generation of very large ground-based telescopes, where, where you know, 50 meter telescopes will, <laughs> will, will be built within the next 10 yeah. years. Um, and it's, it's clear, I think, that astronomy is getting to the point where it will be able to tell us a great deal about these planets around other stars without us leaving our own solar system. We'll know, whether, we'll know the, what the planet's size, their mass, whether they've got atmospheres, whether they've got moons, and we might even know whether they're inhabited if we take spectra of the, the planetary atmosphere and find oxygen or other, other constituents of the atmosphere that are indicative of biology. And all of that we can learn probably telescopically from the solar system. And I don't think a mere flyby mission would tell us that much more. Whereas, if the history of our exploring our own solar system tells us anything, to go to the next level, certainly to understand the biology of a planet or even its geology or its interior, then this requires, this requires spacecraft to actually go and visit. And so the, 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 as, as to, 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 to really make the to go to the next step of characterizing these extrasolar planetary systems, um, sufficient, you know, orders of magnitude, in orders of magnitude more detail than a, you can do with a telescope from the solar system, I think will require you physically to have to place instruments you know, and in, on the surfaces of these planets or make in situ measurements of their atmospheres because that's something astronomy can never do, mm -hmm. looking across the light years of just analyzing starlight. But, but, but to put instruments in physical contact with, yeah. and make in situ measurements, obviously you have to stop at the mm. other end. So, so I think it, as a, scientifically it's very important that starships are able to stop at their destination. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's interesting your take on it's so different from everyone else we've talked to um, because you have this astronomy background. You're really bringing something different to Project Icarus. Um, you know, it's just a different take on things. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't know who else you've spoken to. I, 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 I actually think there is a consensus within the Icarus team that deceleration at the, at the target system is highly desirable mm -hmm. because the, otherwise a flyby mission, you'll only have a few hours to make measurements and you won't be able to make any in situ measurements. Exactly. A, a decelerated mission will enable you to uh, make measurements for years or maybe decades and it will enable you to land um, instruments like the Mars rovers except on some planet around some other star. You, you, you imagine that, the capability of putting uh, spirit and opportunity type rovers on some rocky planet around Alpha Centauri. I mean, you just learn so much more yeah. than if you'd flown by at half the speed of light and, you know, grabbed a few photographs and then that was it. So I think scientifically, I think the team is in agreement that it's desirable to stop at the other end. But it is it is technically much more difficult to do that and yeah. so that this is I think this is where the debate lies it is more difficult to slow down it requires you to take fuel to slow down it greatly complicates the mission architecture mm -hmm. and it would when someone gets around to paying for it greatly increase the cost yeah. so <laughs> so there is there is this issue as to but but my own view is, is I, I, I am quite clear about my own view I think scientifically it's really essential that Icarus yeah. slows down at the other end Agreed. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. I really appreciate all your technical knowledge and everything that you're contributing to the project. And, uh, you know, enjoy the conference and have a nice day. Okay, thank yeah, you thank you thank so you. much. <laughs>